my wife would say um, I made her a priority. Mm. And gosh, I'm sitting here listening to myself going, I did. <laughs> I didn't do all that bad. <laughs> <laughs> We're here with Danny Hodges, pastor from St. Petersburg. Yeah. How long have you been in St. Petersburg? 38 years. Hard to believe. Now, why St. Petersburg? What about that keeps you there for 38 years? Oh, my goodness. I went to St. Petersburg for the first time to play drums for a musician uh, who went to Liberty when I was there, a musician named Scott Anderson. Okay. And I played drums for Scott in a little church that had just started called Calvary Chapel. Oh, so that's how you got introduced to Calvary. And I was working for the airlines in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. I had graduated from college, but I didn't know where I was going. As a matter of fact, in some ways, I thought I'd miss God's will, which is a whole other story in itself. And Scott, uh, I had played for him a couple of times in Lynchburg, and um, he had been down working with another church uh, as an intern, and then a guy that was a youth pastor there started this church called Calvary Chapel, and I played there in a Sunday night concert. And um, I would fly for free because I was working oh, with the airlines, yeah. and I would come down and visit this church huh. because I knew the guy that had started it. And uh, that was the that was the beginning. That was your first introduction to yeah, Calvary. First but, my introduction. But you obviously, if you went to Liberty, you knew Jesus. What kind of church did you grow up in? I uh, was a part of a Baptist church in South Carolina, okay. which, you know, the South, a lot of Baptist churches. Yeah. And then uh, I ended up, um, you know, living a wild life for years because mm. that was when I was a little kid. My, my mother was divorced. My, we lived with my grandmother. She would take me to church, this Baptist church just down the road from where we lived as a child, uh, and they ended up putting me in that elementary school they started and so i actually went to a few years of elementary school at a um, a baptist school okay and then uh i ended up around middle school doing what a lot of us do you yeah know? just getting involved and uh, i started doing drugs started drinking yeah. all that and then when i became a christian at 19 uh that was the church. That was the only church I knew. So that's yeah. the church I became a part of. Yeah. So I got Baptist blood in me. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, I mean, Liberty was just a natural choice for school. Liberty. Or? I knew nothing about Christian colleges. Okay. Um, at this Baptist church that now I was attending and very involved with, um, Sunday night service, the pastor gave a message. I don't know the, what the text was. I don't know the main message, but he gave an invitation. And he said, if you feel a call to what he described as full-time Christian service. Okay. And he gave examples of that, people that had been called to mission field uh, stuff. Oh, yeah. And I felt the Spirit of God move me. Hmm. And I, with a handful of others, uh, walked down at the end of that message in that Baptist church, and I surrendered to what he described as full-time Christian wow. service. okay. Guy took me in the – there was a gymnasium they were meeting in at the time. He took me into the locker room, this counselor, after I after you come forward, and he said, you need to go to Christian college. Okay. What did you think was about to happen? Takes you back to this back room? I had no idea. No idea. <laughs> I had no idea. And he uh, he had been a student at Liberty. Okay, so he had a personal experience with it. But him. these other students at different places, Hiles Anderson College, I didn't know what that was. Yeah, Bob Jones University, okay, yeah, I didn't know what that was. Mm-hmm. They were they were all putting their two cents in. Okay. And the only reason I ended up at Liberty because uh, they had a physical education program. PE. Yeah. Huh. Why, why did that interest you? you because athlete? I didn't feel a call to be a pastor. I oh. felt a call to be in full-time Christian service. Okay. But I thought um, – I didn't feel I was going to be a pastor, so I thought sports would sports. be an avenue. I love yeah. sports. I've okay. always been involved in sports. Yeah. And God has a sense of humor, you know, yeah. because I ended up being a pastor and now 38 years later. Yeah. Crazy. Now, that time that you were playing drums and going down to St. Pete and visiting the church and that kind of thing – that church did you start serving at that church did you plant a different cow i mean what was the connection to saint pete and calvary the guy that had started that church was also from liberty Uh, i knew who he was uh and 
when I would come and visit, and they would actually invite me to come and visit, um, I was still single, had good time off with the little airline I was working for, and he sat me down one day on one of my trips to visit, and he said, hey, we're actually looking for a youth pastor. Oh, okay. And the guy that was doing the high school and the middle school at the time was just going to do high school, and he said, we're looking for a middle school guy. Oh, we yeah. can't offer you any money, <laughs> but if you pray about it, you'd have to get a job okay. when you come down. And I did. Wow. And I transferred from the airline in Lynchburg. And for you older people that might be listening, I began to work for Piedmont Airlines that later got bought out by U.S. Air. Oh. And so I was what we call now in the church a tent maker. Yeah, sure, yeah. Had a skill. Within a Trade. year, um, there were some challenges with the guy that planted the church. Um, the other main leaders were going different directions. The church was going to fold. Mm. I didn't feel like the church should fold. Mm. And they finally said to me one day, well, if the church is not going to fold, you're going to be the only leader left. So you, wow. need, to be consider, you need to consider becoming the pastor. Wow. How, how old were you at the time? 26. 26. And Wendy, your wife, was she in the picture? Not married. Single, I was not 26. Married. Take the church. I uh, got some counsel from guys I knew and respected. Uh, I prayed. Yeah. And a couple of weeks after that time, I went back and I said, I feel like this is what God wants me to do. Yeah. And um, I pastored the little church called Calvary Chapel for three years. So after three years... You're the pastor of the church. I'm pastor of the church for three years. You're 26 single years pastor. old, single, ready um, to mingle. Married my <laughs> wife. Uh, we also went, She also went to Liberty, and uh, she moved down to St. Pete and uh, got very involved. And she's, she was a piano player. She became part uh-huh. of the worship team, she and I was a drummer. Yeah. yeah. Are your kids musical? You know, that's an amazing thing. All three of my boys are all not only drummers, but two of them play multiple instruments, and I never pushed them in any oh, of that. It's in their DNA. But they are very good drummers. And uh, again, two of them play other instruments as well, which so is incredible. What do you love most about being a dad? Like, I mean, you're, you've got this dynamic now where you're grandfather of two, two grandkids in North Carolina. Two grandkids in North Carolina. And your kids are diverse. Your sons, you're telling me one of them's got like a tech computer background. Yeah. One son's at the church. I kind of forget what the other. Our third son works with us at the church, and my okay. second son is a fireman, fireman in St. Petersburg. That's right. They're all unique. They all They're got all different unique. skill sets. So what, what do you love about being a dad to three, my three sons? You know, that's a different era right there, but – like, I love being an older dad now that they're they're older. Right. I know you have a lot of young ones. And I, I, I miss those days. I miss the days when they were young. Uh, but I also very much appreciate seeing what God's doing in their lives. And not mm-hmm. everybody, you know, can say that their children are following the Lord. Yeah, I was going to ask you when you said that. Yeah. Like, did did they always follow the Lord? Did they have to take them a minute to find their own personal? My walk? children will tell you. One of the one of the blessings they had as uh, growing up um, as PKs is they they never felt like PKs, mm. and I can't take credit for that. I just don't know. Um, they just never felt like they were forced to church. Uh, they they just became part of the life yeah. of the church. Yeah, they wanted to be there. You know, when they got old enough to be a part of the youth. Uh, they wanted to be involved. Yeah. And my wife and I look at each other and go, you know, that's the grace of God. You know, at the time that we're recording this, you just gave a great message out of Nehemiah chapter 10 on yeah. a Sunday morning. And one of the things that you said in your message is you, you just kind of shared about your own personal passion, connection, commitment, love, and involvement with the local church. Like for you, it's not a job. You, you love the church. Even when you first got saved, no one had to tell you to like start giving or start investing. You were there. Yeah. And so it seems like for me, people don't follow position. They follow passion. And so for your kids, you know, it was, it was genuine to you. Nobody's perfect. Nobody does everything. No one bats a thousand. But people would rather follow a father who's real than always right. You know, a father who's always real rather than always right. And so, and my, I grew up That's as a, a pastor's statement. kid, you know, I I would say, you know, nobody's got it all together, but if they're genuine, if they're real, well, then I, I okay, I, I that speaks to me, you know. So, I don't know your children, but I would imagine that's got to have some part of their equation of following the Lord is, well, dad really did it. He didn't do it for a paycheck. He did it because he loved Jesus, you know. I think that's a powerful statement you make because, you know, one of the challenges with any 
any time in life, but especially in our culture, the, the family um, and, and the church is in trouble. Families are in trouble in the church. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the things that I experienced, and I know your, your dad would say this, I'm sure, is that one of the things that you have in our culture are dads who are taking their children to church, mm -hmm. but the children don't see the reality of mm -hmm. the relationship with Jesus in their lives. That's right. And so, and I guess that's, that's so vital, and that's why the church is so important more than just some place you attend, but who you are. Well, let me ask you a question about that because you've got great experience in pastoring and fathering and now grandfathering. You know, we're in a unique time in culture and history. Things are constantly changing. You know, every generation navigates that. But knowing what you know, seeing what you've seen, experiencing what you've experienced as a man, as a Christian, as a father, as a pastor, what insight, wisdom, encouragement, instruction would you give to maybe single men, a 26-year-old who finds himself wanting to follow the Lord, or you know, a 36-year-old raising kids, or a 46-year-old about ready to send them off to high school or college or wherever that season is? How can a dad, how can a man um, be that genuine person nowadays? I mean, what, what would you say to that? I mean, what rhythms, principles? I think, especially for the singles that are out there, and you may be single in the sense that you've been divorced, and mm. uh, and now you're looking to remarry at some point, but whoever you are, you're single, uh, and you're a Christian, uh, you want to look for, in character, uh, let me say it another way, you want to become, in character, the kind of person that you're looking for. That's right. And if you become the person in character and commitment to the Lord, that you're looking for, then a lot of people want to find the person that they are not. Yeah, that's right. You know? Yeah. And so it starts with you and yeah. your own, and back to the whole church thing, you know, uh, who you are. You're a Christian, and so this is your family and who you are. And you build that character and you draw close to Christ. And I, not to be oversimplistic, but that's the key. Yeah, it's your relationship to Christ. Yeah. my marriage is dependent on my relationship with Christ, mm -hmm. and then my wife's relationship with Christ, and us as as parents. It all comes back to um, your relationship with the Lord, mm -hmm. and of course, with that, the practicality of making the Word of God your manual. Yeah, that's you good. Know, yeah. In parenting. Yeah, that's good. That's good because there's so many other things that want that voice in your life to kind of give you it could be something as simple as a sitcom you know you just kind of absorb your atmosphere so you just kind of what you watch what you hear what you learn well that's what i'll do you know i'll parent that way or but the manual is obviously emmanuel god's spirit but through the boundaries of his word one of the guys that discipled me said neil don't be afraid to think outside the box in fact always think outside the box but never outside the book and you have no right to think outside the box until you know the book because if you know the book, then be creative, you know, but so many in this culture seek to be creative without having that manual, you know, that you're speaking about. And um, man, I just, um, it's a challenge to see like, well, I have a friend in Ireland, you know, that's a different culture, different government structure, it's a little bit socialistic. And he said, you know, it's hard to find motivated men in Ireland that are wanting to work, get a job, you know, make a paycheck, raise their kids, Take some initiative. Some of that may have to do with governmental or whatever. Yeah. I don't need to get into all that. But you know, I too, I, I as we're talking about this, I think about and not to pat myself on the back at all, but one of the other things my children will tell you is they didn't feel like I was married to the ministry. And I say this because mm -hmm. some of the people listening, you know, maybe in the ministry, and um, I made sure. Uh, that I made the family a priority. Mm. The ministry was a priority, and it has to be. But when I took time off, I didn't take I didn't take hey, my were, work with you me. You were there. Yeah, yeah, I was there. When we yeah. took vacation, or when I was out with the kids, and we were out at the playground or whatever, mm. I didn't take. I didn't take the church and the ministry with me. Mm. And my wife, I think, would say that too. That um, there were seasons especially when I started doing missions work and I was traveling a bit and I was away. Uh, there were seasons that were tough for her when the kids were small. Mm -hmm. 
But overall, my wife would say um, I made her a priority. Mm. And gosh, I'm sitting here listening to myself going, I did. I didn't do all that bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, to have fruitful um, relationships is the richest person, and for you to be able to say, "I've got four children that will still talk to me, that that like me, that love Jesus." One just texted me One's while we were doing. Me. He yeah. just texted my father. I mean, son. everyone comes into your life for a reason, but most people are just for a season, and those children tend to be some of the longer seasons, and so. That's why I have so many of them. You know, like I, that's where I think you can be the richest. You know, is in relationship, but all to your children, and uh, they're, they're the most risky relationship. But it's also the greatest return on re- reward if if done right. But it's daily. Mm-hmm. It's not like this thing you can phone in. At least it's not for me. I mean, with soon to be six of them, they're everywhere. You know, they see every. <laughs> it's daily, and I I find it to be probably one of the most sanctifying elements in my life. Is because boy, something's always breaking. Something's always, and I'm like, okay, you know, be slow to speak, quick to hear. You know, I feel led to say to some of you that may be watching and listening, you don't have that kind of testimony. Mm. You know, maybe you have failed miserably mm. as a dad, mm-hmm. as a husband. It's never too late. That's right. It's never too late to gain the respect and the admiration, and that you can still, even after failure. Uh, be a witness, and you can minister to your children and even your grandchildren. Well, and I think for you, um, even what you shared today in our church and your message in Nehemiah 10, you shared a little bit about making commitments and that life with the Lord is a lot about different seasons and kind of refreshing and rebuilding and, and saying, okay, Lord, this is where I am now, and I'm going to take a step in this direction afresh. I'm going to make a commitment. Um so I think that's a good word because – And you can do it no matter where you are. No matter where you are. And you it, can do it no matter how Because the righteous man falls seven times. I mean, this is what it means to be righteous. So he gets back up. You're, you're just continually moving forward. It's not about perfection. It's about progress like we've heard so many times. But I think that um, that is such a good truth to live by because so many people I think are shackled by, oh, well, you know, this is what I've done. I have an individual who's in my life right now – who, you know, with being a pastor, you administer to a lot of different people. And this person came to me in their early 50s and said, hey, this is who I am. Am I, am I done? Like, can God do anything with me? Look at all I've done through failed marriages, business adventures, name it. This person's, you know, been involved in it. And um, I said, are you breathing? Then you're good. We can move forward, you know. Um, let's not, let's, let's learn from the past, but let's not live there. You know? Isn't it interesting that the man... Um, God says was a man after his own heart and one of the most mm. famous characters in the Bible and in Israel's history, King David. Yeah. And if you read the story about his life, he failed miserably. Mm. He failed as a husband. Mm-hmm. He was an adulterer. Mm-hmm. He was a murderer. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wasn't, if you read between the lines, uh, he wasn't a tremendous father. Mm. But in, even in the later years of his life, after all that miserable failure, he became... Um, a man of God mm-hmm. again mm-hmm. because he started out as a man of God mm-hmm. and so it's never too late so let me ask you a question about that if I may one of the great things I love about your story I, I listened to you share at the um, conference in Merritt Island in the year 2021 is that the year we're in yeah that's the year we were in yeah um, and you just kind of shared so genuinely and so passionately about your love for the Lord um, and about your your it seemed like your your gratefulness to be used by him for the advancements of his kingdom or for the loving of his church or just to be used in ministry. And the point I'm trying to get to is this. You can speak to all of us who say, okay, this was a misstep. This was a thing. This was whatever it is, but God still redeems. God still restores. God still rebuilds. He reuses. He reconciles. He refreshes. What would you say to someone who's in that space, though? Because I do think there's so many in the church, in the pulpit, wherever, that just feel like I'm done. Like I feel like I just can't move on. I, I, I just continue to struggle or I continue. Whatever it is, like how do you speak to someone? What do you say? What about your own story about moving forward and life beyond a mistake, a thought, a challenge, a frustration, whatever it is. I mean, I just loved your genuineness and your um, your your ability to be real. Um, a bruised reed 
he won't discard. A what do you smoldering mean by that? Like, wick. Yeah, how do you explain that? Yeah. The 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 bruised reed, and one of the things they did with reeds uh, in history and biblically is they they make instruments out of them. Okay. Okay. Reed instruments. Um, a bruised reed was considered worthless. You just throw it away. You got to go get a new one. Mm-hmm. And Jesus said, "No, no, no. Mm-hmm. It, with man, it's useless. But He will redeem the unredeemable. Mm-hmm. Um, a smoldering wick." In our culture, it would be like the bur- the bulb is burned out. Hmm. Go get a new bulb. Uh-huh. But with God, he says, no, you don't have to get a new one. I can take the old one, hmm. and I can do a miracle hmm. with the old one. One of the prayers I pray probably regularly now, do it among our staff, and, they, and I pretty much do it every morning we're together as a staff, is there's a verse that says his mercies are new every morning. Hmm. That absolutely fascinates me that every morning you get up God's mercies are fresh and new and mercy is where he doesn't treat you as your sins deserve yeah as you should be treated yeah it's not an excuse to go out and fail some people say well I know God will forgive me well that's just an excuse to go sin so it's not an excuse to go sin but it is the reality that nobody nobody has the kind of heart that God does, and the only way you get his heart is by having a relationship with him. And so, mm. you know, he'll have mercy on me when nobody else will. He'll mm. redeem me when everybody else says he's unredeemable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nobody's unredeemable. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I get emotional awesome. about that because I just, just – Yeah. I've seen it. I yeah. mean, my years of failure with, you know, here I am going down to the dock on my own, you know, and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm drinking beer and mm-hmm. – you know, mm-hmm. I have it hidden. You know, at the house, mm-hmm. I shared that at the you conference. Shared that, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, I have it. You know, yeah. So thank I, you for sharing that because I think, oh. like, you know, you were for you know, in the years of faithfulness, God just continued to bear fruit, and you you kind of share it. I've heard you share it two or three times. Like, I found myself the pastor of the big church. Like, and a lot of guys, um, you know, I've heard a guest that said this way: Don't seek to protect your reputation. Seek to protect your character. Because anyone can say anything about you. You can't control your reputation. You can control your character, which impacts your reputation. But don't seek to control your reputation. Can seek, seek to control your character. Damien Kyle actually made that statement at oh, the did end he? of one of his messages. Oh, I you know, heard, Damien, I know, I've heard of him. I've heard him spare once or twice. But. A few years ago in Merritt Island, and he, he was – I forget what the text was, but he said – and it was like I was sitting in a room all by myself. He said, mm. you take care of your character. Mm-hmm. God will take care of your reputation. That's right. I never forgot that. Yeah. Hold the reputation loosely and the character tightly. But I think the point that I really resonated with me was, you know, a lot of guys seek to protect that reputation no matter what. Like if there's something online, they snuff it out. If there but the thing that I loved about what you what you've done, at least since in the six months that I've seen you speak a couple times, is um, you just trust in God with the reputation, and you're more concerned about the character. Whereas when you when you attain something, because some guys want to be the pastor of the big church. I mean, I went to Bible college. I know friends that are like, man, if we could just get to that place where we got five staff members, or fifteen, or fifty-five, or whatever it is. And but you get whatever it is, whatever patch of grass you think is worth protecting. They want to insulate that reputation and hold on to it. And um, that just, I think the thing that resonates with young people, doesn't matter what the age really though, is I just wanna be real. And see, I think this is where the local church is, is I, I'm sick of McDonald's. You know, like I, I want something that's raw and organic. You know, a lot of kids are like that with restaurants right now. Oh, what kind of smoothie or whatever. But a church that has leadership, that even has accessibility to where it's not about show, it's about substance. You know, it's not about, John Corson trained me in this way. He said, Neil, you need to find a church structure where all that's necessary is a Bible and a guitar. Doesn't mean that's all you have, but that's all that's necessary. You don't need to fill in the blank for the thing to happen. You need Jesus. And like, because what you catch with, you keep with. But I think what resonated with me about your story was that that, that genuineness. Because I think that's what speaks to the Gen Z. That's what speaks to the you know, the millennial, the boomer, the X, whoever generation it is, is authenticity. 
and I we're just tired of fast food. You know, we're tired of the, um, we, <laughs> yeah. need, we need something that's got a little bit of like, that's from down the road, that's organic, that's, that's, that's here. And uh, you know, when, when you speak, that's the sense that I get. And so I think that's where it's like, man, I wanna sit down and have a conversation. Cause it's like, this seems like this is worth recording. You know, <laughs> It's not like, let's just do something. Cause that's what we do. It's like, I don't know about you, but with five kids, I don't have time for that. You know, like I, I need, if it's not real, I'm not interested. Um, One of the churches you well know in, in the seven letters of the church in Revelation, and one of them said, he said, Jesus said, you have a reputation mm. of being alive, mm. but you're dead. That's your dad. And I, I'm, it's sad to say, I think we, we have some of that, maybe too much of that, mm. is that you're exactly right. It's, it's, this is what I am here, mm-hmm. but the truth is, and man, I don't want to ever – I don't want to ever. It's just like living with a ghost. Like Absolutely. there's nothing there. There's nothing there, and it's um, I mean, like you've been a pastor long enough to know that we're not promised even to end this interview. Like time is so precious, and I just don't want to waste it with um things that don't matter. You know, there's um, the celebrity culture. You're deified until you're demonized, and so if you buy into the celebrity culture and ministry, just wait. Because eventually they won't recognize you as a human. You know, you're, you're deified. Ah, oh, look at the talent, the gift, the building, the the butts and the seats, the buildings, the baptism numbers, of the budgets, right? The the four Bs of modern success. But it's just so hollow. It's just um, this ash. There's nothing to it, and uh, it can be gone in a moment. But that to know that Jesus likes me. You know, and like maybe like that old movie, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, John Candy. My wife yeah. likes me. You know, my kid, like, yeah. like that's where value is. So it's like, ah, oh, I'm home. You know, in that sense, like, and I think that's what the generations nowadays, and that's what I love about zeal. Like, I wanted to talk about that for a second. Like, like I love that, that you have a heart to invest in the 18 to 25 year old range and just see them passionately, I mean, zeal, that's where the name, passionately in love with Jesus. Because I think people, even this is an old axiom, right? People don't know or don't care what you know until they know that you care. And uh, people follow passion. They don't follow position. Um, and so I love that you've got a heart to invest. And I know it's about to, let the time of this recording, you've got a semester that's coming up in the fall. Um, can you share a little bit with us about what Zeal is and what, where you got the vision for it and a little bit about that? When we, when we moved into our church facility that we're in now uh, f- a little almost four years ago, uh, there were five houses on the property. Mm. And it, it's one of the few times in my life that I had what I would call a vision mm. and what I saw. Uh, and this is just the truth. I saw the campus and those houses filled with young people. Mm young adults, mm. and I saw them involved mm. in ministry and in the Word, and I didn't know how it was going to happen. I told my third son that works with us in the ministry, I told him about what I saw, mm. and I said, I said, Jairus, I have no idea how this is going to happen, but I believe it's from the Lord. Mm. And now we're, we're seeing it, um, and it's a one-year discipleship program. Um, we call it a school of ministry because we want them to be involved in ministry. We don't right. want it to just be a Bible yeah, thing, just a thing where you're just learning the Academics, Bible. We want yeah. you to get your hands wet in ministry, mm-hmm. and your feet wet in ministry, I should say. Um, we intentionally want it to be small. Oh, okay. Because we want it to be very relational. What, when you say small, what do you mean by that? Well, for example, this semester uh, we will have ten students. Oh, nice! So you're getting very much one-on-one engagement. Ten students, yeah, yeah. So they're going to be at my house. They're going to be at my son's house. Oh. Uh, we're going to be on the campus. We're going to be. We're going to live life together for yeah. a year. Can I say something about that real quick? I had an experience like that. With John uh, and Tammy Corson, when in two thousand, what a privilege! Two thousand six, I think it was somewhere in there. I could talk to you a lot about this, but John had done this thing in Mexico uh, right after Costa Mesa, where he kind of took some guys down to Mexico and did a training thing. But it was like for I don't know the age range, but let's say it was like eighteen to twenty two. Well, I was twenty three at the time, so I wrote John a letter. I had just met him in Rome the year before at some. A thing my dad did, this footsteps of apostles thing. I said, hey, I'd like to do this, but I'm a year too late. You know, uh, 
would you do one for an older group of people? I wrote that letter, sent it off, kind of forgot about it. I was living in Santa Barbara at the time. Moved back to Florida, started dating this girl named Cece, who's now the woman that has my sixth child, my wife. <laughs> and uh, got, a, got a, an apartment, got a forerunner, you know, had a job. And then John calls me, hey, got your letter. Love for you to come. And I said, uh, no, thank you. Uh, like, you know, I've got an apartment, I've got a car, I've got my, uh, this girl I'm really interested in, I got a new job. And my dad heard about it and he said, Neil, if John Corson calls you to disciple you, the answer is yes. Like it's not no or let me think about it. Or I said, well, dad, you know, I got a lease. I've got this girl. I, I kind of want to break my commitments. I mean, I feel like that's not the right thing to do. And the Lord ended up providing for those things and I went. But the point is this, there were only 10 or 12 or 13 of us there. It was a little bit shorter of a time. It was just a three month commitment. But that one-on-one -on -one time, I mean, I've been to Bible college. I and mean, it was life-changing. It was. It was. I've been to Bible college. I've been to a university. I mean, I'm doing those things. But, but to have that like apprenticeship model, to have that hands-on practical at Applegate, because that's how we did. We served at the church, um, and just to be able to like sit at a table and eat a ham and cheese sandwich and talk about whatever, um, it just felt like this is what it's supposed to be. Like, and isn't it interesting, we kind of, it's right there before us in the gospel accounts. Jesus, from his followers, chose 12. Yeah. That they might be, and the first thing it says yeah. before it says he would send them out, that they might be with him. With him. That's How do we right. miss that? Yeah. You know? Yep. So it's some, in some context of pastoral ministry, we got to get back to that. See, and I think students, kids, young adults, whatever the term is, they would say, yes, finally someone I can ask about. How do you change that tire? And what does John 3, 18 mean? You know, because life skills and lifestyle, people don't have. And the reason for that, every thoroughbred needs a trainer. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, how talented you are, how gifted you are, you still got something to learn. I had a guy a few years ago in our church that uh, got saved, got involved, a single young guy. He came to me one day and he said, because uh, he had, he had came from a very wealthy family, and uh, he had just been given for, I think his birthday, a brand new Jeep Wrangler. And he came to me and pulled me aside. He said, Pastor Danny, my, my mother just gave me this, but if I had a flat tire on the way home, I wouldn't know how to change it. Right. Because he came from a situation where everything was done it for was him. It was done, yeah. Yeah, and it's just like, you know, some things that may be assumed, tying your shoe. If I don't teach my four-year-old, she's just going to wear slip-ons. You know what I mean? Like everything needs to be taught to a large degree. Now that doesn't have to be necessarily, and this is what I think about education. It's just an opinion. Every human being is different. Some humans love formal education. Some love informal. Some identify with apprenticeship. So as a church, your discipleship program, yes, because there's all three in your congregation. And like, but I don't think you're ever going to get away from what you're talking about. Be with, be with, be with. I mean, that's why I think as a country or as a church, it's built on families because it's the withness, it's the withness. And I do think that's why you see such an attack because that is the model for training. That is the model for love. It's the model for the church in the sense of familial language. I mean, we serve God, the father, son, and spirit, not God, the father, or God, Godfather, or or CEO, CFO, COO. It's not a not a business, you know. It's um, it's family, and so um, I love that because John, Tammy, Ben. This was a season when Peter John was a was there, and and and, and Christy and the whole crew, and that was a great privilege for you. It for was God to open that door. Yeah, God's and you got a good doors. dad that yeah, came back to right. you and said, "Hey, yeah. John Corson invites yep. you. You need good to dad. go." That's right. Yeah, my dad's always kind of helped me. Like, hey, don't do that. Do this. Yeah. Don't. Yeah, he's always been very faithful in that. That's good. I've always benefited from that. That's excellent. And um, but it is those individuals that invest. You know that you you learn from and you grow from and you develop from. But So we're excited about Zeal. I mean, I think that's a great thing. I'm excited about yeah, Zeal. Yeah, thank you for sharing about it. Um, yeah. If people want to find out more information, what would they do to find out about Zeal or pray for it or how do you? Calvarystp.church. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. I don't even know my – I don't even Google know our it. own website. Zeal, yeah. Danny, you'll yeah. find it. Yeah. Let me just ask you a couple last very important questions. Mountains or the beach? Which one for you? Oh, <laughs> you, 
You asked me at a time in my life, I'll be 64 next week. Oh, happy birthday. And what I dream of this life in God's will, if it ever happens, I'd love to have a little bit of both. Yeah, Santa Barbara. In my (laughs) senior years, I'll always be involved in some kind of ministry, Mm. um, but I believe that just like you and your dad Mm. uh, have a God-given thing where you're working together, Mm -hmm. I see my son and I doing that in the future. Mm -hmm. We're working together now, but in a transition where I mm-hmm. give him more responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I got grandkids in North Carolina. Oh, there you go. There's I could mountains. see myself, yeah. you know, in the mountains of there North Carolina yeah. for a little while and then yeah. back down in the wow. beaches of St. Pete. That worked out. So I'd like to do both. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Uh, cake or ice cream? Oh, my gosh, ice cream. I could eat ice cream every single night. So surf or turf? If I only had one, believe it or not, as much as I go and catch, I love fishing, but I like catch. I, mean, I love catching. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. If I only had one, I would choose turf. You would. But beef or steak? I like the combo. You like the combo. I'm a, I'm a steak. You're a steak guy. Steak and chicken guy. Steak and we chicken. We just went to the hibachi grill down the road oh, you last did? night. Yeah, that's a great and, spot. My kids, yeah. we do birthdays and stuff. My kids. I had filet and chicken. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. It was good. Okay, let me see if there's anything else we can say. Okay, bike or, or car or public transportation or private or, <laughs> yeah. Bike or car. Um, it, when, if God allows me to do the mountains a bit and the beach a bit, I have a staff member that's getting ready to retire in a couple of years. He's moving to Hendersonville, North Carolina. He told me he would keep my Harley. Oh, you have a real bike. My Harley at his new house in the mountains of North Carolina so that I could come up and ride with him. So that kind of bike. How long have you been riding Harleys or bikes? I grew up riding motocross and stuff, oh, you know but I would not have a, a motorcycle where we live because it's just too crowded, too dangerous, too mm-hmm. many crazy drivers. Yeah. But yeah. in the mountains, uh, I would consider, especially because my wife just said that she would actually ride on the back with me some oh, of those rides. there you go. Well, this is my last question. It's actually about your wife. I just love for her own tidbits, you know. How long have you guys been married? be 35 years this coming july 26 35 years you know the date that's good date night or pursuing wendy or learning you know her language of love or like i mean you know no matter what season of marriage you're in you you should constantly be dating your wife and pursuing her and discovering new things i mean what does date night look like for you guys or you know how do you in your in your sense and perspective i mean that's a healthy marriage for healthy children how do you get there? What's date night look like? How do you how do you pursue Wendy? What lights you up about Wendy? I mean, anything you'd say about marriage and pursuing your spouse? For me, I am adventure driven. Mm-hmm. I love going places. Mm-hmm. I love theme parks. I love I just love adventure. I love life. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I love and my challenge is to make sure that as I'm planning things and going places and doing things, that I communicate with my wife. Mm-hmm. And what she would like to do. Ah, that's a good word. That's my challenge. Yeah, and so I try to be consistent with making sure I'm saying, hey, what would you like to do, whether it's a vacation together or whether it's a night out, where would you like to eat? So have you asked her about a Harley in North Carolina? Absolutely. Okay. She's, I actually she have a picture that. of yeah, us both sitting on behind. one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for being in Gulf Breeze with us and doing this little podcast and for teaching our church. It's been a, been a joy. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, St. Pete, it's where you are. If people want to find out about Zeal, yeah. Google it. You'll find it. Calvary Chapel Fellowship, St. Pete, Florida. Okay. Thank you, sir. Wow. You're a great interviewer. <laughs> He's a great interviewer. Yeah. I would not be able to do that. Man. <laughs>